Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, this particular seminar or uh, webinar is going to be called Rethinking Risk in the COVID-19 Era. Uh, thank you for joining me today. And uh, my name is Dave Ruger. I am the Chief Information Security Officer for Invite. Uh, we're one of the fastest growing health tech companies. Uh, we, we deal with genetic testing and converting that genetic testing into data. Uh, that can help uh, transform healthcare for uh, basically billions of people around the planet. That's our overall mission. Um, I've been doing information security now for well over two decades, and uh, uh, certainly I've seen quite a lot. And uh, I'm hoping to share with you some insights today as it relates to risk management in general uh, and some of the things that I've seen over the course of my career. And hopefully you'll get a little bit of a blueprint of some things you can take away after this particular webinar. Um, about uh, some things that you can do to potentially rethink risk in general and apply those principles to your uh, individual environments. So uh, first of all, why don't we start with what the problem is when we talk about risk? Uh, you can very easily manifest this by asking a very simple question. What is the risk of an unlocked car? Well, if we look at something as simple as uh, this particular, let me move this out of the way here, uh, this particular graphic where you can see that we immediately go to uh, it, the, the, the first idea of what we think about if we have an unlike car is that someone is going to steal it. Um, but when we think about the context of what actually happens when you start to think about risk, you start to very easily realize that what it means to have risk for an unlike car kind of depends on where it exists. Um, so in the case here, we have a very expensive car uh, sitting out in the middle of nowhere in, in the woods. So if this car is unlocked, what is the real risk of this car uh, being unlocked? Is someone going to be able to steal it? Mm, highly unlikely. So then we start to drill down a little bit more and think about what about an unlocked car that's actually sitting in a locked garage uh, that's inside someone's home? Certainly having an unlocked car in this scenario doesn't really represent a ton of risk unless, of course, you're keeping your garage door open and your house fully unlocked and you don't exist in your home. So um, finally, when we think about uh, another particular scenario of an unlocked car, this would be a classic example. No doubt this car is unlocked. Uh, the tires are flat. The engine probably doesn't run. It's been sitting there for a long time and an immediate question comes to mind. Would someone even bother to steal this? Um, certainly it's unlocked, but the value of the car, given the condition it is, that it's in, doesn't necessarily warrant the effort it's gonna take to try to steal it. Um, and in this case, if the car doesn't even run, even if it's unlocked, trying to get it uh, from the location that it's in will uh, require a significant amount of effort with very little return on that effort to try to maximize the value of the stolen vehicle. So when we think about all of this in the context, we have to really take into consideration what are the various parameters that go into this particular scenario? What is the risk? It's an unlocked car. Okay, but what are we talking about the risk of theft? Are we talking about the risk of theft of property inside the vehicle? Um, are we talking about potential damage to the vehicle? Or if it's actually stolen and used in an unauthorized and illegal way, are we talking about potential liability for the individual who owns the car? None of this is apparent by the problem statement, which basically just says, what is the risk of an unlocked car? So I would hazard that uh, if there's anything that you can take away from today's session, it's this. A risk without any type of context is not a risk. It's an issue. And I would venture to say that most of you have risk registers already that if you look at the context of various risks that, that exist there, they're really listing a bunch of issues. Very classic example. Uh, I've seen this show up on multiple risk registers in multiple companies, which will say something like this. Um, we have a risk that's related to us not having MDM. Well, okay, so you don't have a multi mobile device management in place. There's probably some risk there, but it's not really quantified. Um, is it you're really thinking about the loss of data because you don't have an MDM? Or is it another risk that's tied to the overall access for individuals to things that they're not supposed to see? 
you don't really know because you don't have the context there. And therefore that risk register doesn't identify risks. It identifies items that are potentially just issues. So risk basically is the problem. Without anything that really qualifies the scenario of what you're trying to identify, uh, it's very difficult to come up with a strategy for how to remediate that risk or even if you need to remediate that risk. And so in effect, risk is the problem. What we need to have are three very key things when we're talking about any type of risk. An identifiable threat actor, someone, something needs to act upon a vulnerability which could exist either in source code. It could be um, a vulnerable location, like a facility. Let's say you have an unlocked door. Um, and then ultimately it has to tie to an actual business impact. What happens if that vulnerability is exploited? Basically, the scope of your risk will define how you treat the risk, how you quantify that risk, and ultimately whether it's going to be worth putting any effort in to remediate, or if it's actually better to avoid the risk altogether. Scope not only matters, it is everything when it comes to risk management. Which then leads me to the other problem with risk. When we start to think about how risk gets quantified, how we talk about risk and how we uh, communicate it to executive teams, to business leaders, to risk owners. This is predominantly how you see that view, red, yellow, and green. And so the first question I would ask you that you should ask yourselves is, do I understand what the real impact of this particular risk is when it's identified by three colors? Now, we're very well accustomed to these three colors. We see them in everyday life. When you're in your car, you see a red light means stop. You see yellow it means caution, and you see green, it's good to go. Now, what does that mean in the context of risk? Does risk mean that we are in a state where we feel like we're satisfied if it's green? If it's yellow, does that mean I should do something or maybe I should do more than what I have been doing? And red clearly means something's broken, we need to act. But I would hazard that having this kind of a three-tiered approach of, of putting everything in the context of sort of a very fuzzy view of something being risky or not risky doesn't really give you the necessary context even around the risk treatment to make informed decisions. So this gets us into the two different types of, um, uh, of, of looking at risk and how we treat it. The qualitative approach looks at things much like the red, yellow, green, where if we look at likelihood and impact, which have been traditional indicators of how we view risk, your likelihood goes everywhere from it's not that likely to highly likely to certain. And then the impact clearly also goes in a similar approach of being low, medium, high, or catastrophic. Now, inherently and intuitively, we understand what these mean, and it's very much a litmus test to try to get a certain response based upon an overall aggregate feeling about whether or not this represents lower or higher risk by the likelihood and impact. The problem is the likelihood in this type of a qualification is very subjective. It's not very accurate. The impact when we talk about low, medium, high, and catastrophic also puts us in a position where we're really focusing more on gut feel, intuition, and a general sense that we should be doing something based upon the various qualifications that we have. Now, when we move to a more quantitative approach, we have a much different view of what likelihood and impact represents. It's much more data-driven. It focuses more on being accurate, not being so much on the precision. And the idea behind this is that you're looking at things like ranges, ranges of impacts and dollar amounts, ranges of time, all of which lead you to measurable results. When you look at risk in this context, ultimately what you're going to be um, formulating is a picture that looks at your risk in terms of dollar amounts. This is a business decision. Ultimately, shouldn't your 
drivers for risk remediation plans be based upon a certain expectation of losses. This is how insurance companies work. Uh, this is how we look at business continuity. Why would we not also apply a similar approach for how we treat risk? Now, when you start to make those determinations of treatment plans, you can do them in a very informed way. Like for example, if we have a situation where the likelihood is fairly high and the impact is going to be on average over a million dollars, but it will only cost us $250,000 to buy some new software and implement it to reduce that risk, that's a very good risk treatment plan. However, if we have a different type of risk where the likelihood is not that high and the impact is very low, but we have to spend more money than it would take for us to actually treat that risk that it would represent to the business, that's not a very sound business decision. And now we have the data points that can actually point to making much more informed decisions for the business. So when we think about risk overall, there's two main categories that ultimately flow into an overarching list of subcategories. There's mostly enterprise-driven risks, which deal with the business itself, people risk. This is everything from your competitive landscape, uh, your financial risk of the business, uh, people kind of leaving organizations, getting sick. Uh, in some cases, people actually sabotaging the company. Um, trying to, you know, introduce threats as an insider threat to the business, all the way to the operational side, where when you think about quantifying risk and getting putting real numbers behind things, this is where most of your risk treatment plan will live. Technology-based risk, aging hardware, cybersecurity threats, logistical threats, and then ultimately things like, you know, major outlying events like earthquakes, fire, flood. Uh, pandemic, uh, political risks, right? These have huge impacts to the business, but the likelihoods uh, fall into very small categories so that your overall assessment of things that would uh, fall into this particular area generally puts you into the long tail of risk um, and requires a slightly different treatment plan, sometimes which just would require uh, larger insurance policies, quite honestly, to manage as part of a, a business continuity plan overall. So when we think about supply chain, the pandemic has actually escalated a lot of what we see with our supply chain risk and is forcing us to really rethink what constitutes a good treatment plan and a good preventative plan when we deal with the supply chain overall. Uh, in 2021, we saw supply chain attacks increase by threefold. And the areas that we've seen where most of these hit, I'm sure many of you were aware of these or probably had to respond to these. Solar winds, of course, was a big one because of the impacts to many companies that use that software to distribute um, patches internally and to maintain part of the internal infrastructure. Kaseya fell into this category, as did Cloudstar. This is effectively using a vendor to uh, manage part of your internal IT infrastructure in an automated way. So if this particular vendor is compromised, and you don't know it, they can spread their malware at scale and you wouldn't even know about it. The software approach also led to a number of different um, compromises. The Excellion one was interesting because there were tons of companies who were compromised because of their software that led to data breaches and to breach notifications and other types of regulatory fines as a result of using that software. And then finally, in the open source world, we saw Log4j recently, um, things like UA Parser JS. These were examples of companies that are highly leveraging open source technology, open source software within their own products that then creates an additional level of risk when it comes to distributing those products and then maintaining them, uh, which could ultimately lead to breaches through the company because of the use of that source code. What this really means is that we have to rethink how we do vendor risk management, and especially with respect to the supply chain, it increases our footprint of really need to understand what our third party risk is and what the risk is of software that we're including in our products. Which brings us to kind of the overall approach when we look about third-party risk management. 
we have to be concerned about people. Are we dealing with contractors? Is it staff augmentation? Is there risk of having those people in the environment? There's process related, meaning are we hooking up services? Do we have to be concerned about workflows, elevated privileges and access rights, whether it's at the people level or a service to service level are things that need to be considered when we look at third party risk in general. Data, of course, is the huge driver in all of this, especially if you have a regulated industry where you have to be concerned about data breaches and breach notification procedures, whether that's with things like GDPR or in HIPAA or other kinds of healthcare related industries where that type of risk uh, is going to have a severe impact from a regulatory standpoint. And then finally, because of the supply chain, we are actually seeing fourth party risk, which is not even just your vendors, but the, that vendor's vendors introducing additional levels of risk in the supply chain because anything that happens with their vendors becomes a problem for you eventually if it leads to a breach scenario. So when we think about the third party risk management overall, the first question you have to ask yourself is what matters most? Focus on that and really do your assessment based around where it's going to create the biggest impact for you as an organization. So this brings us next to the, uh, the huge trend that we saw in 2021, which was ransomware. Um, probably a, a large part of the reason we saw this uptick was because of the pandemic. We saw a workforce that was largely migrating away from a uh, controlled corporate environment with networks that were highly maintained and have lots of security controls in place to essentially having everyone working remotely from their home environments or coffee shops or other types of network environments where there's not a lot of rigor. Um, home networks in general generally have no uh, additional security controls in place other than what's done by default in your cable modem router. Um, unless you're a really savvy individual who works in IT or networking, you probably haven't taken a lot of time to look at the defaults and configure it in a way that really secures your own home network from attacks that would be happening from all of the devices that you have accessible within your home, including the IoT devices, which we know have been notoriously open to zero day attacks because of configuration drift and, and lack of patching in general. So when we look at this chart, what we're actually seeing is that in 2020, uh, there was a huge uptick in overall attacks that ramped up through the year and actually continued into most of 2021. And uh, we have some examples on the side here, which really point to the types of uh, attacks that occurred and the downstream impacts. Uh, the, the biggest ones, I think, would be the Colonial Pipeline and the JBS Meatpacker, which as a ransomware attack, was very highly targeted for a single business, but because of the downtime that was experienced for Colonial Pipeline, it created a massive uh, uh, energy backlog with the uh, delivery of fuel throughout the Eastern seaboard. There was a run on gas. Uh, we had long lines at gas stations. So the impact was very high to society as a whole, not just to this particular business. And again, it, it just points to a lot of the overarching supply chain problems that could be very impactful for uh, a lot of the general society outside of an individual company. It's also why there's been a huge focus in the current administration of shoring up our supply chain and actually increasing cybersecurity requirements for things like the utility space, anything that's in the, um, the gas or energy producing environment because the downstream impacts to everyone are so severe. Um, the other big area that happened as a result of this ransomware were data leaks. So Accenture, Acer, Excellion, as I mentioned before, all created environments whereby the ransomware, the attackers who were successful in that ransomware attack were able to pull data from the Excellion server in particular and publish that online that created a breach scenario. So all these companies were now eligible for regulatory fines because of that supply chain uh, problem in the Excellion software that led to ransomware and, and a data leak. And then finally, the last thing I wanted to point out is that uh, in the cyber insurance front, AXA actually pulled 
all of their underwriting business for cyber as a result of the increase of these ransomware attacks. Um, and they decided that because of this uptick in the, the risk that they were seeing with respect to spreading ransomware, they chose not to underwrite cyber insurance policies uh, and they would not pay out claims for ransomware as a result. So the cyber insurance industry itself is reevaluating how they're going to be uh, paying out claims and what's going to be required for businesses to qualify for those payments based upon the maturity of their cybersecurity programs. So one of the things that I've done uh, with my current company, with a few of the other businesses that I've worked with in the past, is thinking about how do we tackle the ransomware risk in a way that makes it easy to understand uh, at the board level to communicate out, but also incorporates the things that would be really important to allow us to focus and, and create higher degrees of maturity in our security program as a whole. So I've broken out a ransomware readiness kind of metric that looks at four key areas. Your outside view of risk. So this would be what is your publicly accessible footprint, both in terms of um, you know, websites, applications, uh, potentially exposed assets like S3 buckets that could be readily accessed from an outside attacker. This also looks at your domain footprint. So all of the websites associated with your business, whether they're the, the main corporate domain or subdomains or even affiliate sites, all kind of goes into uh, looking at the risk posture of what is publicly accessible. This would be normally vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. Your internal risk then looks at things that would not necessarily be publicly accessible, but certainly if we're compromised could lead to a, uh, uh, a spreading of malware and uh, a lot of risk at scale. So this ties directly to your vulnerability management program, how well your endpoints have been configured. Do you have uh, anti-malware software? Is your asset management done effectively so that you know where the assets are? Is everything being patched? You can put percentages in place of uh, entire state of endpoints versus the number of uh, endpoints that have been patched and gives you an understanding of basically how much risk you're shouldering internally in addition to that external risk. The third area is people risk. This can traditionally be done through phishing campaigns so you can see how much uh, of your uh, organization is prone to phishing. This would likely be some level of percentage you could track over time and <clears throat> done in conjunction, conjunction with both the internal and external risk metrics gives you an idea of what your overall exposure to a particular vulnerability is based upon someone having been phished. This is also where you can get endpoint security metrics and some of the DLP related to user activity can all go into giving you a view of how well you're able to respond to that risk uh, of, of people activity. And finally, incident response being kind of the last gate of your ability to uh, effectively respond in real time goes directly to the uh, effectiveness of your security incident management program uh, your security operations center, incident response in general, and then ideally how well you have assets that are super important to your organization backed up, recovered regularly, tested, and validated so that you can respond to any type of a ransomware event by merely going to a backup instead of having to consider paying a ransom because you need access to data that you don't have a valid backup of in order to recover. And so finally, when we kind of take a look at all of this in totality, um, the best way to approach it is to take your program, align it with a framework, and then uh, have that framework aligned directly into a maturity model. So this is taking a look at things like NIST, high trust, ISO. The framework is really not as important as it is uh, aligning towards a level of maturity for the controls that you have, because many of them are fairly common across the frameworks. So looking at the implementation, uh, you can look at uh, basically the various levels of that maturity model of are things documented, are they implemented, do they have repeatable process, is it optimized, and are you regularly auditing it? Um, all can, <clears throat> can be done against a scorecard 
that then will show you percentages so that you can track your improvement over time and then effectively show great improvements in your risk reduction as a result of that alignment. And so finally, I will leave you with these uh, three key takeaways. <clears throat> First, if you can remember anything today, risk without context is just an issue. That means a well-defined scenario will have to identify both the threat and the vulnerability and the impact of the vulnerability being exploited. Try to use a data-driven approach because this will give you a really good uh, foundation for having objective measurements. Um, accuracy is much better than precision. Use ranges. They work better than exact amounts to give you an idea of an overall effective range of your risk. And then finally, take your risk, map it to a maturity model. And from there, you'll get some really good insights that will help you focus on the right areas in your program to uh, try to do some remediations to get real bang for the buck ROI on that investment. And here's a few references of some things that I referenced in the talk. And with that, thank you very much. Hi, it's Mark Bernard here, uh, and I'm here to make a presentation tonight uh, regarding the keys to a successful uh, cybersecurity program. So uh, let me begin by sharing my slides on my desktop, and we can start the process here. I have about 25 minutes to deliver this, so I will be talking fast, and we'll be taking some, uh, some messages uh, uh, or, or questions in the chat. So feel free to uh, to send us uh, a chat message. Okay, that'd be great. All right. Hope you're all having a great night. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the business plan and program alignment with the strategic uh, plans of the organization. We're going to also talk about business communications. You're going to hear that phrase a lot because business communications are very, very important in order to get stakeholder and employee engagement. Also, uh, soft and hard skills. We're going to talk a little bit about that, about program management, architecture, and systems engineering. All right, so 30% of the process uh, when implementing a cybersecurity program is planning. So getting organized and, uh, and having a strategy on how to implement. And then 40% is execution. And 30% of the success, I believe, is connected to communication. Okay, I just want to thank uh, uh, Orange County Chapter of ISACA for allowing me to come in and make this presentation. Uh, Orange County uh, Chapter of ISACA provides many uh, value-added services, as you know, like many uh, ISACA organizations, but Orange County, we do it a little bit more special, I believe. Um, provide certifications uh, that are focused on the different skill sets that we need in order to be successful in our careers. They also plan events uh, like this one, uh, so that the membership can uh, hear different speakers talk about different subjects and get different angles on what those subjects are about, which is uh, provides value and skills. And then, of course, the networking component uh, to meet new people, people who we want to connect with, uh, people who maybe can help us with our, our, uh, our goals and our objectives, uh, whether through mentorship or perhaps uh, new opportunities, but, but also sharing knowledge, very important in, in ISACA. And that's one of the things that ISACA does very well uh, worldwide. And I speak at a lot of different ISACA chapters, and I can tell you that ISACA does help for sure. Um, okay, let's keep going. I'm Mark Bernard. In case you don't know who I am, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there easily. Uh, I, I talk all the time about cybersecurity. I'm a bit of a champion for it, but uh, in my daytime job, I'm really a, just a strategic GRC advisor. And I work with customers, Fortune 50 banks, uh, US cloud computing network with unicorns, uh, VirtuStream in Washington, DC. I worked in San Jose with uh, Trimble Hosting uh, and Marantis also uh, in this area. And um, I work all over the US actually. I mean, I am a Canadian, but my uh, family uh, actually immigrated from Europe to Long Island, New York, where we had a farm, 500 acre farm for a short period of time before the, uh, before the 13 colonies rose up. And then we packed our bags and we went to Prince Edward Island and we live in Canada. But I have lots of cousins in the US and uh, I, I do consider myself just as much American as I am Canadian. Okay, um, let's start with a quote. Computers are useless. They can only give us answers well. The computers are only as smart as the people who program them. So if they give us answers, it's because of the human component, no doubt. 
because as you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, but uh, none of the computers actually have achieved uh, self-awareness yet. So uh, Pablo Picasso, thank you very much. Uh, Zoom fatigue. Wow. You know, uh, people are so, uh, you know, we've been quarantined, locked up, uh, kept away from the office, kept away from our colleagues. And the only way we connect is through these video uh, conference sessions. So it's quite a time in our worlds, uh, good and bad. Uh, we've learned a lot of lessons, I think, and Zoom fatigue is one of them. How many times have you been in a meeting where somebody starts talking and they're on mute? That doesn't happen every day. But Maybe in the future, it would be a good idea if people did have mute buttons to begin the conversation. So something to think about. Okay. Um, why have you been asked to implement a cybersecurity program? This is probably the first question you need to answer. Scope and why have you been asked to do it are two very important questions. Uh, is there revenue attached to it? Because uh, most of the customers I work with in the U.S., there's really two reasons why they implement a cybersecurity program. Uh, one of them is because... Uh, it's an opportunity to get new uh, new revenue. So maybe they've uh, gone through RFP uh, process. Maybe they're going through a pursuit to chase customers. Uh, and the customers are coming back and saying, what are you doing for cybersecurity? So they say, well, let's implement a GRC framework like ISO 27001 or COBIT and, or NIST cybersecurity framework. And then we'll satisfy the customer's requirements and we'll win some new customers. So revenue is attached to it. Perhaps a regulatory agency also has come in and made some findings and uh, they're not too happy with the way that uh, the cybersecurity program has been implemented. So they're gonna make some suggestions on um, perhaps you should adopt the framework. Uh, the board of directors may also be asking about it. Perhaps they have some customers, existing customers who are asking about it, or maybe they see this as a competitive advantage because again, I said there's two reasons in the US I usually see cybersecurity programs implemented. One is because a customer is asked about it. the other one is because we're pursuing new customers. So there's opportunities. Market capitalization, right? <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> um, what is your strategy? You need to have a game plan because you know what? The executives never want to see you coming to them with empty hands saying, what do I do? <laughs> okay. That's not a cool thing to do with the executives. They don't like that. Okay. So you need to uh, come to the executives with a plan. And my suggestion is as follows, okay? So, oh, and uh, point number one, you need to ask, are you coming in to clean up somebody else's mess? Because if you are, you might have to pick up the fragments. You might have to do some damage control. You might have to, you know, coming in and starting from scratch is the ideal situation, but coming in and cleaning up somebody's uh, mess is gonna have, there's gonna be a lot of issues that you're gonna have to deal with. So um, yeah, and you, you need to find out what those are. Okay, two, uh, do you know what framework you'll use? Will it be COVID? Will it be ISO 27001? You know, ISO 27001 is the grandfather of cybersecurity and it was developed by the UK government to deal with supply chain risks. That was back in 95. And then it got adopted by uh, Geneva, Switzerland, the ISO organization and became uh, 2701. And now there's a whole family of standards. But along the path, when COVID uh, 4.0 was first created, uh, it borrowed a lot actually from the ISO framework. And it's not the only framework that did the IAPP for privacy did. CSA Cloud also borrowed from it. And so did PCI. Uh, many, many organizations. You can see the fingerprints if you look closely. Um, will your strategy include communication plan? Oh, there we go. Okay, I said communication plan was important. It's 30% of the solution, right? Uh, you need to understand the culture of the organization and you need to know how to engage with them. And the communication plan needs to be designed accordingly in order to capture the hearts and minds and put boots on the ground and, and get people empowered and engaged in the process because it's people that will help deliver this. And of course, I strongly uh, recommend, this is a part of the strategy I was mentioning before, is that you know you have a one-page strategy, you do the, uh, the dog and pony show you go around and meet with all the stakeholders and present them with the strategy say do you think this will work and if they say mm, say ask ask them why why won't it work because you need to know right because you want to you want to implement a very successful program so get their input okay very valuable they've been there for a while they have some experience with that company they understand the culture so find out why they think it will work or won't work very important question and uh and doing it one-on-one -on -one, you get actual honest answers uh, as opposed to doing it with a committee and a group of people sitting around a table because then they only answer uh, questions in a way that uh, won't put them out front of their colleagues usually. So it's, you know, better that way. And then uh, take whatever feedback you get and make version two and present version two to the governance committee, the oversight committee, 
not version one. And uh, the governance committee will ask their managers, hey, have you seen this before? Do you know about this? And of course, all the managers will nod their head and they will say, yeah, we met with that guy or that gal. And she um, or he um, went over the strategy with me and I provide some valuable input. Make sure they know that, right? That's how you engage with people. Okay. Table of contents, the business plan, as you, as you build the program and implement the program, you also want to line up the program with the strategic uh, and tactical goals and objectives of the organization. So you want to build a business plan for cybersecurity. It includes an introduction, company profile, strategic goals and objectives that you're going to line up with. Also the program governance committee, uh, who's involved in that, just titles, not names. Uh, and then you want to set out some performance uh, criteria, such as uh, key performance indicators. And of course, there's critical success, success factors, part of me, that goes with that. And internal audit plays a role. A lot of frameworks don't include internal audit, but in the ISO world, in ISO 27001, there's a whole section on internal audit. Internal audit helps to verify and validate the program, make sure it's working properly. They are management's ears and eyes on the ground in the operations area to make sure that cybersecurity is working. So very important to engage with internal audit. Um, Risk management is the decision-making uh, process that we use uh, in management. So it's very important to come up with a good plan on risk management. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. So you need a policy, methodology, procedure. You're going to need a risk treatment plan to deal with the uh, immediate issues. And then you're going to need a risk registry to deal with long-term issues. Risk registries are more aligned with the COSO Enterprise Risk Management Framework. Uh, more higher level, uh, so they need to be mapped down. Uh, the uh, risk treatment plan is really about operational type risks that you're resolving that are serious, and we'll talk about that risk appetite too. Uh, continual improvement quality management is a part of every process. It should always be, there should always be a feedback loop. We should always be looking how to improve things. Business communications, oh, there it is again. <laughs> so a lot of business communications going on. Again, 30% of the solution, you need to talk about the business plan. You need to talk about your strategy. You need to have good talk, uh, not bad talk, that engages people. You want to have good talk that engages people. Okay, very important. You want to have awareness training. So in some cases, people won't know what you're talking about. And you're going to have to spend a little bit more time hand-holding, maybe holding some sessions uh, where you uh, provide some instruction on what it is that you're looking for. Uh, uh, this is a good idea. You want to empower those employees, give them the tools and the knowledge they need in order to be successful. Very important. And then, of course, document and record management. So we're going to document policies, procedures, and standards. We're going to control the critical documents that are important for operations. And we're also going to identify the records that need to be maintained for the auditors and also to do our performance reporting to make sure that everything's working properly. Very important. Who are we? We are the Bernard Institute for Cybersecurity. This is my uh, my legacy I'm building here. Uh, it's going to be a, an institution that's going to develop new knowledge and share knowledge with people, kind of like ISACA does, but differently because uh, we're not ISACA. We'll never be as big as ISACA, but we can definitely, we have a lot of experience over uh, 30, de uh, 30 uh, years, you know, three decades, um, worked in 11 of 16 critical infrastructures. There's a lot of knowledge uh, to put down on paper and put into training programs and help companies. Uh, so I'm planning on doing that. Uh, we're strategic advisors. Uh, we do sit at the big table with the big boys and girls, and we talk about uh, what your cybersecurity program should be doing and what it should look like. I built many, many uh, cybersecurity programs in the U.S. I work about 98% in the U.S., and um, many, many programs for global organizations, all the way from Fortune 50, uh, Morgan and Stanley type, to nanotech like Fot Photronics in Idaho, many manufacturing companies uh, on the eastern seaboard as well as in Silicon Valley. I've even worked for U.S. federal uh, cloud service providers in Washington, D.C., so um, lots of experience there. Strategic advisors and uh, building those cybersecurity programs so that they work, they got to be doable. Senior management insists on them being doable and no surprises. And I'm right there with them because I agree 100%. Okay, going from zero to hero. Um, you've been called in, uh, you want to build a successful program, the building phase, you do a gap assessment of the management system. That's clauses uh, four to 10 in the ISO framework. It includes governance, uh, risk management, continual improvement, internal audit awareness training. It includes uh, business communications and continual improvement. Uh, 
Okay, so they're all included in there. You got to do some business plan, as I mentioned, create that business plan, line it up with the strategic goals and objectives. You need to do program documentation because in order to get past the capability maturity model, level three to four is the target area. Uh, five, if you can get there, but definitely three and four uh, for sure. Uh, you need to document things and then you need to put in some performance criteria in order to measure those processes, make sure they're working okay. And you got to work with operations, make sure they're um, along, uh, coming along and you're, and you're helping them. We're going to talk about capital projects and the difference between operational and capital projects and things that you need to fix just quickly. Okay. Um, from stabilization, uh, this is where the policies and procedures uh, get actions and we start to do some compliance checking. We also follow the capability and maturity model to make sure that uh, we're um, growing again from that target area three to, uh, to five. And uh and we also look for baseline performance. So we're going to set some baselines, you know, when it comes to uh, monitoring for intrusions or threats or cybersecurity attacks, uh, we need some baselines. We need to understand what is normal behavior and what is not normal behavior so that we can uh, know when to detect and investigate and triage and what have you, things that cybersecurity people do. And then, of course, we need to do some resource management because we need to know what kinds of skills do we need? Uh, do we already have those skills? Are there people that can be cross-trained uh, resource management, very important to go into your budget uh, in case you don't have people uh, for the implementation, you might have to hire contractors temporarily. And then, of course, conducting audits, uh, have the auditor review the project plan, have the auditor review the progress, uh, report back to management, make sure that everything's going well. And then, of course, then there's the steady state after you get past stabilization. This is when you flip the switch and now you're fully operational. Uh, you're going to have quarterly governance meetings. You're going to have day-to-day -day program management by the CISO or whoever the designate is for your cybersecurity program. You're going to be monitoring the budget, make sure that you're not overspending or underspending, that you're uh, purchasing things that you said that you needed. Um, and also the resource management, make sure you have the skills, you're developing the skills in-house uh, for the people who need to take care of the program. Now, guiding the cybersecurity program requires uh, you need uh, to have some key performance indicators, strategic alignment. You need to make sure that the cybersecurity enables the business. So your cybersecurity leader is involved in the pursuit of new business, but also in the main maintenance of uh, existing customers to make sure those existing customers are happy. Very, very important because if customers aren't happy, they leave or they create problems. Um, so you need to make sure the customers are happy, but you also need to make sure you pursue the new customers, right? And make sure that those contracts are lined up with your existing framework. So strategic alignment, risk management, as I mentioned before, uh, improving the risk response time, closing down those risks, making sure that they get treated in a timely fashion. Business process assurance. Uh, the auditor will help with that, but make sure that there's no gaps in the information asset protection framework because a gap could lead to a breach. Value delivery, make sure that the investment in controls never exceeds the value of the assets. And that's that means you have to do asset valuation and then you have to be able to build your architecture or at least document it and then put some numbers around it to make sure that you're not already overspending on the uh, cybersecurity architecture. This is just responsibility right around the leadership of the cybersecurity program. They need to be responsible people. They need to have many soft skills and hard skills. So, so when we talk about soft skills, we're talking about leadership, team building. Uh, we're talking about being able to do accounting, uh, managing business plans. Uh, these are not skills that uh, you know an analyst has who's coming out of a cybersecurity program normally. So those skills are also important. Um, but you need to have both soft and technical or hard skills. Okay, resource management, uh, being a people manager. Again, there's another area where, um, you know, if you're a technologist, you're probably not going to have your uh, finger on the pulse of employees. You can probably care less, to be honest with you. But if you're a people manager, you care a lot about it, right? So you realize that those resources are important. You want to keep them happy so that your business operates properly. And you don't lose, have a high turnover because if you have high turnover, you're going to be doing a lot of recruiting and not much management, which is not fun. Trust me, I know about people management is so important, right? Um, also, the frequency of problems. So you want to make sure whoever you hire has the right competencies so that they can help resolve problems and shut them down. And you shouldn't see any reoccurrences. Performance management. How much time does it take to detect a threat or an attack? 
And how long does it take to respond to that? So you need to have some performance in terms of your uh, cybersecurity framework and how it responds. Okay, now you have a governance committee. They provide oversight initially during the project implementation, but there's a good chance they're gonna stick around the same people or they might change seats um, and help you manage the program moving forward on a quarterly basis or a semi-annual basis. These people have to be senior managers. They have to understand what are the regulatory obligations? What's the statutory obligations? What are the laws? What are the internal facing contracts? So we have licenses with people and those, uh, those companies that have licenses with us like Microsoft and Oracle and, who, and Cisco, they have proprietary information. We're supposed to protect their proprietary information. So let's make sure we do that. And then of course, most importantly, the revenue streams, the external facing contracts, so important. And then of course, uh, as we go through the risk assessment process, and we evaluate threats and risks, we're going to be building a, a registry of controls. Uh, this is approved, authorized controls. We don't want people to implement controls that have not been risk assessed and uh, registered and approved by the governance committee. We always want to push back on that, make sure that we evaluate those scenarios to make sure that they fit with our program and our organization. And then the governance committee will help us make decisions around policies and procedures. And we'll also make sure that the job descriptions are lined up so that we have, you know, segregation of duties and the right people, the right bums and the right seats, as they say. Okay, on the uh, risk management approach, I do not uh, usually use a qualitative approach. I've done that many times when I was younger, but as I got older, I got smarter, of course, like all of us. <laughs> and, uh, and now we do a quantifiable assessment. So based on 100% scale, we have five uh, boxes, really. We have extreme risk, critical risk, high risk, medium risk, low risk. And we set a risk appetite in the risk uh, management policy that says that everything that's 80 and above gets dealt with quickly and efficiently. Um, critical uh, risk get dealt with within four hours. We shut them down. Extreme risks are shut down within two hours. Some examples would be extreme would be a breach. That would be bad. We want to shut that right down. Um, critical risk could be a zero day threat. Um, maybe we don't have a patch for it yet. So we need to create a workaround to deal with that. Everything else uh, from 79 and below goes into continual improvement. And this is where we get our capital budgets, the segregation or the separation between capital and operational budgets. So you can see operational budgets, these are the things that fall into those first two buckets. You know, uh, we're talking about breaches and we're talking about zero day threats. This is what drives the operations, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, this is a risk treatment plan. We uh, would populate that, or it could be registered in a service desk. We might be using the service desk to manage this stuff. And then on the operational or the, pardon me, the capital side, these are the things that go into a roadmap. We plan for these. We integrate them into uh, projects that are coming up or else we build one project a year that cleans up this uh, roadmap to make sure that all those continual improvement activities are taken care of. And these are the high, medium, and low risks. They're all risks. Uh, some risks we might accept. So maybe low risk we accept. And we only actually deal with the high and the medium. It's possible. Going to have a way to organize it, though. It's all part of the strategy, right? Okay, now this is a security uh, architecture framework. Uh, it has 10 layers from the edge firewall all the way down to business continuity because business continuity is sort of the last straw, right? You've blown away all your databases. Now you need to recover. You need to rebuild your infrastructure and your systems. And uh, But before that, you have cloud. So cloud is a very good uh, technology to use these days. We can have multiple instances, but make sure you test your failovers because so many companies go to the cloud and they never test failover. And they never have multiple instances, some of them, uh, or they don't, or they think they do and they don't. And then when they fail over, they realize they don't. Um, so you have your edge firewall, you have a demail or tri zone. This is where we put like things like reverse proxy to deal with denial of service attacks. Um, on the outside firewall, of course, is where we have uh, physical security mostly in our edge firewall. You can see up here, uh, level uh, three, we have the interior firewall. So the rule is that two firewalls separate your critical systems from that big, bad old internet, right? So scary. Uh, so you have uh, NIPS, uh, firewall, security zones, et cetera, et cetera, defined here. Then you have switching and load balancing behind here in DNS. In level four and level five, you have your access control systems. So some people think that access control is actually at the front, but that would be crazy because the hackers would have a field day with that, right? So we have multiple layers here to filter the packets before they actually get to the access control. Very interesting, eh? 
a lot to learn. Uh, level six, uh, anti-malware endpoint protection, which is very popular these days with so many people working uh, away from the office, right? We have complete mobile workforces these days. Um, then we have DLP and SIEM, so sharing intelligence, gathering intelligence, evaluating events and threats, and investigating, right? And data loss prevention, of course, making sure that people don't walk out the door with the roller decks because that's going to cost us some money. And uh, and then you have your cybersecurity management system, which I mentioned, uh, which is only defined in ISO 27001, clauses 4 to 10. Uh, none of the other frameworks have that management system. So it's very important to... Uh, look at that closely. You need that. And I already mentioned level layer, pardon me, layer nine and 10. Okay. Let's move along. You're going to need to look at the logical flow of data through your systems. This is an example of an uh, intrusion prevention system, how the packets come in from the untrusted network. They end up going into your internal network, but what happens between here and there, very important, understanding the packet flow, decryption, any sniffing that might be going on, uh, network access control, inspection of the packets, and the IP console, very important to do most of this logical or analytical uh, work in real time. Okay, uh, so that's uh, the data flow. This is the physical, so the actual device. So what kind of chips does it have on it? Uh, where are the input ports, output ports? So you need to look at this as well. If you have a good cybersecurity architect, they're going to look at all these things, uh, get right down to the details and make sure that it's all mapped properly. Those in the details, they say. Now, more and more systems are uh, claiming to have artificial intelligence, but we know there are no self-aware systems out there or else all the humans would be removed from all the computers because <laughs> the systems would automatically know the biggest threat that we have are humans. So let's just remove those. Um, no, we're doing a lot of machine learning. Uh, our, it's on the path to artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of checking, a lot of people, human effort is going into uh, the evaluation of um, you know uh, machine learning and we're moving toward artificial intelligence for sure but we're not there yet um, the supply chain is always going to be a risk uh, we've hear uh, so many times about some cybersecurity projects uh, products like you know McAfee way back in the day remember when Kompersky got kicked out of the US but it was actually McAfee that was infiltrated and they used it to exfiltrate data from the Pentagon I think it was so it was kind of funny but McAfee stuck around they're still sticking around for a long time um, and then there's, uh, of course, SolarWinds was the most recent one also targeted uh, for U.S. federal government, which is bad. So the supply chain is very dangerous, uh, all the way from the components where they get created to where they get assembled. These are some big areas where there's a lot of risk. And then when the product gets, uh, you know, uh, completed and gets put into a storage facility where the sales team go to work selling these products, and, and then the distribution channel. So every step of the way, there's an opportunity for some kind of uh, nefarious activity. That's a technology chain. Here's a pharmaceutical chain. The same kind of concept applies from the you know, collection of raw materials um, and the development of DNA or, or maybe some kind of a virus um, DNA and how that gets put into uh, you know, some kind of a formula. And then, and then maybe in this case, we're building uh, some kind of a vaccine maybe through a, a tablet and of course the distribution of that and finally to the consumer so every step of the way there's always an opportunity for something to happen probably more so in the early stages because it's more bulk and it's being shipped around by you know tankers and trains and stuff so there's probably more chance for things to go wrong there than anywhere else Okay, and the food chain is also a risk. Uh, remember way back, uh, Bush Jr. Uh, after 9-11, that unfortunate, unfortunate day. We're all so sad about that. Um, but after that, uh, uh, Bush Jr., he came out with a project called Project Vigilant. And a lot of people don't know about it or they don't uh, you know, think about it. But it's been out there. And as far as I know, it's been renewed and it's still going. Project Vigilant was about uh, securing America's food chain. Uh, so this is very important. Um, and, uh, and here you go, you, you know, you have wheat growing, what if somebody altered the DNA and then that finally got into food products and sold to humans and consume, you know, what could that do to us? So they were thinking about that, uh, way back in 2000, that's been going, I'm not sure what the status is of that, of that project, but it's still going as far as I know, uh, in order to get down to the risks involved in the supply chain, we need to do three PE assessments. This is where we sit down and evaluate our chains. When I, uh, 
led a team of 130 at Morgan Stanley. I had a team of 16 architects and we reviewed 4,000 um, uh, cust- um, business partners, I guess, brokers and people who are doing business basically uh, in the supply chain with Morgan Stanley. We evaluated them very, uh, very closely. And uh, we have this kind of assessment approach, right? And there's kind of five stages to this. So obviously there's some uh, vendors that you want to look at very closely because they have a strategic impact on your organization. And then there's other vendors that maybe they just sell you paper or something, right? So it's, there's no need. Uh, so you need some way to quantify it. This is part of your strategy, right? So if you have a good cybersecurity strategy, you have an answer for every question the executive or the board of directors are going to ask you. So make sure you have those answers. It's completely a team effort, right? So the whole part about communications is making sure that your team can be part of the process, making sure they're engaged, they're involved, and they know what to do. Um, Every cybersecurity program needs a team, and the team is the whole company, in fact. Okay. Uh, Now, Morpheus, a big fan of uh, The Matrix. Maybe not the latest one, but all the earlier ones were pretty good. And there's this great quote, uh, which I think all auditors can relate to and uh, technologists and cybersecurity professionals. And there is a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. And I know the path and I've been walking it for many decades and I'm sharing some of that knowledge with you right now. So I hope that uh, it's been useful and you found some value out of this conversation. There's been uh, lots of statistics uh, to back up what's going on out there. You know, 30,000 websites a day get hacked. 64% of companies worldwide experience at least one form of cyber attack every day. It's a war. People don't realize there is a war going on right now on the internet. And um, yeah, it's wow. And of course, ransomware grew by 150%. We hear a lot about that. It's mostly because companies won't deal with their privileged users. You know, there's two things that uh, ransomware really attacks, uh, but they need to get access to privileged user uh, credentials in order to encrypt the data because the privileged users own the data. They own the applications and that's how they can change them. Right. So you need uh, more identity and access control. We need better ways of managing privileged user accounts and and uh, the operations team just needs to, you know, suck it up. And, uh, and get those privileged users under some kind of administration and management control because uh, it's a big risk to us. All right, uh, enough of my soapbox. Let's continue. Oh, that's it. That's the end of the slides. I just want to thank uh, ISACA Orange County. It's a real privilege to be able to come here and talk to uh, 